You're listening to the Gabe Molina Podcast. Ryan, welcome to the podcast, man. Thanks for having me, I appreciate man. you coming out. We've been working on this. We've been talking about this for almost a year, right? Last yeah. October was the last time we visited with each other. Was that the Illa Steel with uh, no, the No, th- it was the uh, uh, Renee's event. Battle um, of the Alamo. Battle of the Alamo City. Yeah. Yeah. So that's cool, man. So uh, you're with Mobilized Beast, or you're the owner of Mobilized Beast, right? Yes, sir. Veteran-owned. You're a veteran. How, how long did you serve for? So I was only in for a year before okay. I got medically discharged from mm-hmm. a training incident that uh, kind of yeah, went too. south. Yeah. So, but I keep that same, I was a cop as well. Oh, after really? That, and then I San did, Antonio? No, I was a uh, Reno. Oh, okay, okay. So I also keep, and I did contracting work for 10 years. So I kind of have a lot of that same mindset throughout yeah. that whole decade. Yeah. It takes the same kind of personality, I guess, to do all those jobs. So, oh, yeah. so that's cool. So what got you into the, uh, uh, I guess, the therapy side of, of uh, athletics and everything else that you're doing these days? So a few years ago, I was uh, bodybuilding okay. and I started trying to become pro at it. Had a few shows under my belt. And I got into car accident. Mm. I got T-boned. Ended up being pretty much paralyzed from waist down. Couldn't walk. Really? Couldn't run. There was no way. I couldn't even lift. And so ended up trying to go through different doctors. They all told me I needed surgery, needed hip replacement, knee replacement. And the biggest thing. that's a big. It was bad. Yeah. And I don't know what was going on with my lower back. I know that there were some definitely herniations at that point. But the biggest things that stand out for me was the replacements of my biggest joints, you know. And at the time, I didn't even have any money. So there was no way I was going to get those surgeries. But the biggest thing that was stuck in my head was the fact that I asked them, okay, after the surgery, when can I lift again? They're like, you're done. Really? No more more lifting. Like, you're going to be lucky if you can walk out run like running is going to be very difficult for you and so i was like okay and now i'm going to get definitely second opinions kept getting second opinions they all told me the same thing ended up just kind of natural healing took its course and i was able to recover enough where i could walk without too much pain but there is still no running there was no lifting or anything like that for about seven to eight months and then when i got into the academy for being a police officer my lieutenant tased me like mm. we were doing our training and I got tased in the you back. You did have the surgeries though, right? No. Oh, you didn't? I didn't. No, okay. it was just natural healing because our body does these things that, you know, if you have surgery or you don't have surgery, depending on the injury, more than likely there's not really going to be that much of a change as long as you don't have like a complete tear or something. Mm. But if you have a herniation and you're able to move around, you're not bedridden, more than likely a surgery might not really change too much. And that's, I worked at an injury clinic, chiropractic injury clinic, where we dealt with car accidents. That's where we saw that the most. It's mm-hmm. like, hey, if you got the surgery, the spinal fusion, you're gonna get better in six months. If you didn't get the spinal surgery, you're gonna get better in six months. And that's was kind of across the board. Yeah. So I think that natural healing kind of took its course on that one and I was still not 100% though. And I still, again, I could barely walk. But I was able to do the academy. And during our defensive tactics training, I got tased. That was part of our training. And it flared everything back up, tying to all my back <laughs> back up to the point where, again, I couldn't move. Yeah. I could barely walk. And when was this instant or was it over It was time? instant. Really? Like I got tased and I got set down. And as soon as I got up, I was like, oh, this, this feels wrong. And I started limping. And then I had to sit down right then. And I was like, all right. It took me about an hour or so before I could get up. And I went home and I was like, dude, fuck. Oh, can I swear? Absolutely. Okay. So yeah, I was like, I'll shit. cuss with you here in a minute. <laughs> I, I was like, shit. I'm, I remember this pain. It was the worst pain in my life again. So my lieutenant felt so bad for me that he sent me to my, his chiropractor, which is his brother. His brother told me I'm too jacked up. I can't, he can't work on me. So he sent me to a sports massage therapist. And that guy is my friend, my mentor, Bobby Baum in Reno. He was the guy who showed me this kind of side of things by using it on me. And it was the worst pain I've experienced other than the actual injury. 
But then I walked up and I was like, I can move. My hips feel good. This is weird. I've never felt this for the last like year. Yeah. And I was like, so how long does this last? And he's like, you're good, man. I was like, okay. So when can I start training? I can't train, right? And he's like, no, dude, let's go train right now. So we went and squatted 275 for six. This is again like six to seven months without ever touching a barbell. And now this is this is right after you this is had within seconds. Issues. Yeah. Wow. Like, or sorry, I went there and then an hour later after our session. By the way, I was crying during that session because it was that painful. <laughs> and then an hour later, after or an hour after I came in, I was squatting two seventy five for six. And the only reason we stopped is because he's like, "Hey, let's let's try not." screwing up everything i messed up or let's try not fucking up everything that i worked on today yeah. how's that and i was like okay and so that kind of started my transition from i guess the security mindset into the more therapeutic mindset and so i kind of bring that same mentality of and at this point you haven't you hadn't had a background in therapy right no okay i mean i i didn't know anything about health or wellness or anything like that the only thing i had in my background was nutrition bodybuilding and a little bit of training here and there and, and supplement i owned a supplement company as well so and i and i definitely bring all that stuff to my therapy and that i think that's what really sets you know you won't see too many massage therapists that have a background in nutrition background in training a background in trying to become a a pro athlete and then on top of that, also know a lot about supplementation. But that's where, that's where I work with a lot of athletes very well because athletes do supplement stuff and sometimes they'll use shit supplements. And so I can bring that to their avenue. And then on top of that, their sh nutrition is shit because they don't know that much about nutrition. And their coach knows a lot about training, but not so much on nutrition. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because when you're trying to specialize in something, I guess, as an athlete, and, and I use like a Austin, for example, and uh, we've talked about it before, and they're, they're just so hyper-focused on this thing, right? And, and which is getting stronger and, and being more athletic. There's other aspects to that, and they try and train themselves on that, but to become a, an elite athlete, you have to have, you have to specialize in, in the thing that you're in, but you also need some support from people who specialize in the other aspects that support that. Because I would imagine at some point you're going to plateau, you're going to, you're going to hit a certain point because your knowledge base has stopped and whether it's, it's your supplements or your, your dietary things that you're, you're consuming, your knowledge base is only so far. So to be able to bring somebody in that they can uh, support that and also be a supplement to what they already know, the knowledge base. That's got to be, that's, that's kind of the kind of thing that puts you on the other level. And, and, uh, I think that's kind of what you're getting at is, is those are the things you bring to the table for folks like that. So oh, yeah, that's a, that's pretty awesome. And you need to be, I think as an athlete too, like you can't be a jack of all trades. You have to be the best at your sport. Right. And if you start going in most of the time, most people that are an athlete don't even know that their supplements aren't the supplements they should be taking. And so that's where we'll kind of put that in. Like you can talk to anybody and they'll be like, yeah, I use Gatorade. That's my electrolytes. And so we'll, we'll just start tweaking it where it's like, okay, well, let's use actual electrolytes. Gatorade's a great electrolyte, but let's use actual good real salt or B vitamins, some magnesium glycinate, some act like we'll just sprinkle that in where they don't even know they're doing it. And then all of a sudden they feel so much better. And it's like, okay, well, now let's start taking the Gatorade right away and see if you still feel better. And we just make minor changes like that. And that's over the course of six months, we make really, really big changes, especially if we're seeing them almost weekly, you yeah. know, like several times a week. And just seeing how they're feeling when we're slowly changing things without them really noticing. So you go to this, you go to this therapy session, you feel good instantly, you start squatting. It did, how long did it last before you had to go back again? And the reason I ask is because sometimes I sit there and I go, as a, uh, as a terribly handsome, out of shape, older gentleman, I sit there and I go, the issues that I have currently, I'm going to have for the rest of my life. You know? and, and that's hopefully just me being ignorant to, to what's out there and, and the benefits of the kind of thing you do. But is it one of those, is it like everything else where it's kind of, you just have to keep going back and it's something that you do for the rest of your life? 
or I guess through changed behavior and, and eating properly and being more active and mobile, you can, you can not have to go back to the pain that you were experiencing before. I think it's a mixture of both. Now, I will say that don't want to shoot myself in the foot here, but massage is kind of one of those luxury items mm -hmm. that it definitely speeds up recovery. And especially if you're dealing with a chronic or an acute injury that's just debilitating right there, it's going to change your life in that moment, right? But as if your massage therapist just kind of works on you and then sends you out the door and says, all right, we'll see you when you see him. Hopefully you get we'll better. We'll see you when you feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just then it's kind of like they're setting you up for failure because they're not really addressing the, the key points where a lot of the things that I learned is when I got, when I left that table, one, we went and trained. So that's a lot of times what I do in my massage practice is right after I'm done working on you, I want you to train because I want you to use that muscle now that we've moved it around and we, it feels better. Now that it feels better, you're going to do a lot more than you thought you could do mm -hmm. beforehand. Like if I, if I can't move, I can't squat. If I can't squat, I can't squat 275. But if, if that limiting, if my hip is the one that's limiting me that, then how is it going to get better if I don't do it? The moment I do squat 275 and I do it without pain, there is a brain connection going down to that muscle that says, we're good. Yeah. We're not in pain anymore. So that's going to speed up that recovery. So it's going to tighten back up a little bit. But the moment that your brain thinks about it, it's going to be like, well, I squat 275 and there was no pain. So we're not that injured. Yeah. And it slows the process down of tightening back up. And then when you get homework from the, your therapist saying, okay, now that we did this, I want you to start adding in these pre warm ups or these uh, mobility routines and stretching these when you go home at night. Stretch them when you get up in the morning. Add these little exercises in. Those are going to be what actually make you not come back. I'm going to ask you a lot of stupid questions That's today. That's all right. There are no stupid <laughs> questions. No, I've got a few. So sometimes, uh, sometimes I get super lazy. And uh, I find myself when I get ready to exercise or do so. I've gotten on this kick now where I keep a lot of stuff in my truck because I like going to the park and doing it. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's nice being outside. But I find myself going not warming up, not doing the little little things to kind of start stretching things out to get warmed up. I'll just jump right into it. And I find that that uh, things get tight, things hurt, uh, and I don't do anything afterwards. Like as far as like, I guess, stretching again. And every day I'll kind of sit on the floor and I'll stretch and I'll, I'll you know, I'll kind of do that kind of thing. But I know that I'm cold, you know, and I, a lot of times it feels like every day's starting all over again. You know, I may feel a little bit better. I might be able to get up and down a little bit better or stretch a little bit farther, but it's, it doesn't feel like I'm getting anywhere. So I need to start doing little stretches before I even start my exercise. Huh? Well, and, and the other way is looking at it is, or the other way of looking at it is instead of doing long static stretches, do one minute of dynamic work. So if you're going to, what's the difference? So dynamic is when you're actually using the muscle. So leg swings or okay. um, there's a, this thing called the world's greatest stretch where you get into a lunge position, you move up and do all this crazy stuff. But that's dynamic because you're constantly moving. Okay. Static is where you're just sitting there stretching the hamstrings, you know, go down, bend over, touch your toes. Well, that's what we did in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a, there's a time and a place for that. Yeah. You know, but the biggest thing is if you stretch a muscle... What is it going to do? It's going to relax and it's going to hype or sorry, it's going to get flexible and not contract right. as well. So if you're going to use that muscle though, you want it to be contracted and stretched at the same time. So doing dynamic is going to allow for a little bit more of a stretch or sorry, not a little bit less of a stretch, but more of that dynamic or that more of that contraction. And that's a better benefit than doing the other in, for, in some cases. In, in the case that you're talking about, about right before you're about to work out or right before you're about to do some jogging or any type of workout, yeah, that's going to be a lot more better. Okay. Now, again, it's not always. It's not a guarantee. It's more of a general statement. Now, if you have an area that uh, really hurts, like let's say your hip, and you're about to do some 
some running, some light jogging, but every single time you land on your hip, it just really, really kills you. And you can tell that this is just really tight or you have lower back problems, you sit a lot. Then doing a nice stack stretch before you do that is gonna be a lot better than doing dynamic warm ups for the hip. I'm gonna have to show you, I'm gonna have to have you show me some good oh, yeah. static static stretching. You know, a lot of my problem is we, uh, one being fat, the other one is, is being at a sedentary uh, job, right? So I always tell people, and I've had this conversation before, it benefits my employer if I sit at the at the desk all day. Now we have standing desks now, and, and I'll, I'll stand up, I'll do some stuff, and I'll sit down. So I, throughout the day I do that. Uh, the last place I was at, I had a kettlebell and a, a resistance band and a block of wood, so I would stretch and do some movements like every hour. And uh, that was helping. I, I, I kind of mentioned to you earlier, you are like, well, what hurts you? And I'm like, everything, you know? And it's funny because it, it, I'm, really, I'm really not being sarcastic. It's like... You know, at one point I talked to my sister and she's, she has rheumatoid arthritis and I guess dad had it too. And she said, you might need to get checked. Cause I told her, I said, every day it's something and it's an ankle, it's a toe, it's, you know, it's a hip. And I, I know that I have planters in like my right foot. So there's times where like my heel hurts so bad. So even if we go on a trip to the Valley or, or, uh, if I've been working for a couple of hours and I'm going to get up to go walk to the restroom or walk around a little bit, it gets real tight. It takes a little bit to kind of, I guess, loosen up and, and move, you know? Uh, but in particular is the lower back kind of thing. I think I was telling you, uh, my right shoulder blade has, well, this, this sounds terrible, right? <laughs> because the lower back thing, I kind of, I kind of started taking a uh, muscle relaxer pain pill and then I add a little Tylenol and a little ibuprofen and some, you know, little concoction and, and it gets me through the night. There was a uh, last year, we had a lot of things going on, but last year it was, uh, it was one of those things where it was like, I was getting about an hour and a half of sleep a night. So I would lay down on my back and I would all the way across the lower back, it would just seize up and it just tighten up and uh, it would wake me up to where I wouldn't get any sleep. And it was about an hour and a half a night for, I'd say, about six months, man. And then uh, finally I ended up going to the doctor and got me on the muscle relaxer. Uh, but I noticed if I would lay on my left side and i throw my right leg over to where it would even just hang off the bed, I had all this tension in my lower back on that side and, like, my upper ass on that side. And uh, so I talked to Tim about it a little bit. He's like, man, you, need, you know Tim. He's like, you got to stretch that out, dog. And so, uh, uh, it sounds like Tim would just say, you just got to work out. Yeah. He was lift more weights. <laughs> lift heavy weights. I, I tell him, man, I'm lifting, I'm maxing out every time I get out of bed. What are you talking about? <laughs> but you know, getting that stretch in and then all of a sudden the shoulder thing started happening again. So now I'm at the point now where, okay, with my little, uh, my little chemical concoction, it, it gets me through the night. But the, the really bad part is that shoulder. And, uh, and so it gets to the point where, I haven't laid on my right side or I haven't laid on any side outside of my left side. Oh, well, front or I used to be a front sleeper too. Uh, but I have to lay on either my back or I roll over to the left. And I have this, um, what do they call the Tur Turkish, uh, Turkish bag, you know, mm -hmm. little shape of a lamb or whatever. Yeah. So now I've got that thing on my bed. And so I throw some pillows on top of that and that's what I kind of put my leg on top of. But it's funny because you know, we talked about about this this podcast and getting together, and it's like these are issues that, when I think back, it's happened for years, and it's only been really bad now for about a year and a half. But I've allowed it to just keep going. You know, I've got a chiropractic buddy that I haven't I haven't reached out to, but uh, you know, it was kind of like, well, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. And after a while, you find yourself going, man, I, I got I got some okay sleep. I'm all right. And you just kind of keep going with that, but. If I continue that route, is it just going to get worse? Yes. Okay. That's that's the easiest way to answer that. Okay. There is a <laughs> there is a diagram that we used in school that was really awesome, but it was a it was a clock pretty much, and it was called your pain free range motion. And once you get injured, your pain free range motion goes down. Okay. But your body doesn't want to fail the actual painful range of motion, so it stops right before you hit that painful range of motion. Mm. It stays, so pretty much decreases the pain-free range of motion just a little bit because it doesn't, it's guarding and doesn't want you to actually go into that point, the so, end point. So your mobility is gonna lessen over time. Yeah, and so as that time progresses, your pain-free range of motion shortens, but so does when you're guard. So pretty much, let's say that you start at six o'clock, your pain-free range of motion is 50%. Mm -hmm. 
you're going to stop at five o'clock because your body doesn't want to go six o'clock because that's where it stops. Yeah. But now your pain free range of motion is at five o'clock. So it stops at four, stops at three, stops at two. And then all of a sudden, two years later, you're like, man, I used to be able to raise my shoulder just right about like arm length or right about chin height length, chin height, <laughs> man. But now I can't even raise it above my belly button. What yeah. happened? Like I wasn't, I wasn't moving it. And that's why, because you weren't moving it. Motion's lotion. That's what keeps our joints and ligaments better. And it's what you're saying about when you go for a walk and your plants or your heel kills you. But once you get movement in, it loosens up and you feel fine. Yeah. That's your body literally telling you, hey, the more you move us, the better we're going to get. Yeah. And I'll use an example of my dog. My dog, uh, when I got back from Myrtle Beach, my dog was having hip issues. And we were working a lot uh, leading up to it that I was only really walking my dog once a day. Mm -hmm. And I was Wait, thinking, real quick, what's your dog's name? Ronnie. Uh, I have two dogs, Ronnie and Cassie. Hey, Ronnie and Cassie. <laughs> <laughs> so he, I was thinking that he was just getting hip arthritis and I was getting worried about it. He's about eight years old, but I was more thinking about, okay, what can I do to get this better? And I was thinking about what I would do if someone was telling me they were having hip issues. I would tell them to just do what they can, walk and get better. If you can swim, that is like the golden yeah. thing you can do. Swim is going to be really good for the joints. Obviously, he's not going to be able to swim in a pool. They won't really let him. I think it's a little animalist, but okay. <laughs> My apartment doesn't like it. So Best. what I started doing is making sure it's mandatory that I'm walking him twice a day mm. and doing shorter walks versus the longer walks. And all of a sudden, four or five days later, He's jumping, he's doing all the things, and all we did was we made him move more. Yeah. And all of a sudden, his hip's doing a lot better. So so I think what, what, uh, for people who didn't quite catch all that, we've got we've to dive into some discomfort to get to the comfort. Well, and it's not even that much discomfort. It's the fact of doing what feels good, what feels that you need to do, and doing it lightly. Like, for example, your walking thing, you might have... It might be discomfort for a little bit of time, but it's not unbearable. Right. It's it's just annoying. Like think about if you ever had a little little brother or little sister, and they do that thing where they say, I'm not touching you, mm. but they're that close. Yeah. And it's so annoying. That's where you want to be. <laughs> yeah. Like whenever we're doing therapy, we always stay in that range. I never want to get to the point where I'm like, how are you feeling? They're like, this is an 11 out of 10. Because your body's going to guard and it's not really going to get that much out of it. But if your body's saying like, dude, I don't like this, but I'll deal with it. I really just don't really want you to do this, but we can tolerate it. Yeah. Eventually your body's going to relax to it. And that's the idea. Uh. So walking, moving, swimming. And the reason I love swimming so much is because you really can't hurt yourself too much because your body's going to go through the path of least resistance. So if you kick and you have knee injury or knee issue, the moment you kick in water and it starts hurting, your knee's gonna cave and it's gonna go through whatever range of motion it needs to to stop the pain. Mm. And that's what I love about water aerobics, anything. Anytime that I'm, especially when I got injured in my knee, I was in the pool every day. Yeah, I lived right next to it and I was there every day at 5 a.m. just moving around, trying to swim. And I've realized that even though I was in the Navy, apparently they don't do a very good job of teaching you how to swim or I'm negative buoyant. I don't know. But the first thing I think about when I get into the pool is how can I get out? Yeah. I hate it. No, I, I love it. You know, I, I've even noticed I haven't been in the pool for a long time, but we used to have a gold membership and we would go over there and uh, before they changed to something else. But uh, they had a pool there. And, you know, even just treading water, even just, you know, walking in the pool, you know, all that, it's, it's, uh, it's your body constantly adjusting to the water moving too. So you don't think about it, but it was funny because, uh, diabetic. So I would always end up with really low sugar when I got out of the pool. Cause I'd be in there for two hours and, uh, I didn't realize how much my body was adjusting to other people swimming, the water moving, you know, and, and then the exercising that I was doing. And uh, I always felt exhausted when I got out of the pool, even more so than if I went for a walk. Because after a while, even even here at work, I get a little self-conscious because uh, 
my heel hurts, right? So I'm walking. I got a buddy who, who, who works there as well. He needs to get his hip replaced. So I make a point not to walk with him anywhere because we look pathetic. But, uh, but I notice there's this long hallway. The office manager sits at the end of the door. And like I get self-conscious in the sense where I'm like it. I know I'm limping like crazy because it hurts really bad once. The initial get up and walk in. And so I kind of push, but I'm adjusting everything. And I start leaning more on my left side, right? Because I'm kind of compensating for the right heel. And uh, yesterday I was, uh, <laughs> I forgot what I was doing. I was, I was taking the trash out or something. And uh, all of a sudden my uh, left hip starts hurting. And uh, I kind of had to stop there on the sidewalk in front of the house. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? And uh, so I start walking and every second or third step, I'm like, oh, the hip hurts. So I go inside and, uh, you know, I start thinking about it. I'm like, well, I've been compensating for that right heel a whole lot by leaning on the left side as well. Uh, and, and, you know, all that stuff, it's, it's crazy because all that stuff is interconnected. And the more you adjust here, the more you're going to end up having to adjust of it here. And then before you know it, you know, your your calves are tight, your heels hurt, your lower back's tight. You know, it's now, a never-ending battle. It, it really is. And, and you know what's funny is, like, when you're young, you're like, eh. You know, I'll be up. I'll be fine in a couple of days. And that was always kind of my I'm kind of getting to the point where I realize I need to be more uh, uh, I need to take more responsibility for for that movement because it's not just going to get better because because of youth, because the youth is gone. I'm fucking oh, yeah. 47, you know, so being more active and taking more responsibility in that is, is very important. So, oh, man, I tell you what, uh, you're a godsend with the stuff you do. How many clients are you currently uh, serving? On a normal on a normal basis, I have about ten to twelve a week. Okay. And then I have several sponsored athletes that we just work on them as many times as they need to. And Austin being my biggest one, the yeah. one that just world seventh in the world strongest man. Yeah, he did great. It was amazing. First year, got seventh place. We were honestly just expecting to just get to if we could get to the finals, that was the, the biggest part. Yeah. But having to get seventh place and just seeing how much how much different he felt every single day and being able to adjust our training or adjust our our recovery to whatever he's feeling. Because one thing what was So that's not pre planned. You're going by the day and what he's feeling that day. Oh yeah. Gotcha. No, it, there was a little bit of planning because we we knew the events, but there obviously you plan and the moment you plan you throw a wrench in it i didn't bring anything except for my hands and that's it and your knowledge base yeah yeah so we we have i have and floss this is my my big thing that i always bring um but i have cupping sets you know dolphin stem all these different things that we could definitely use grass and blades but i knew at the end of the day that whatever we planned on doing, it was going to get a wrench thrown into it. And the moment that that happened, if I would have planned on using those things, it would have just been thrown out. So we, and luckily there was a Best Buy at Academy right next door. So we could have got something if we needed to, but we changed things as we need to. The biggest thing that was really cool to see is that how well he did without having the luxuries that other athletes in there didn't have. Mm. So one thing that, um, people may not know is that World Strongest Man had their own massage therapy people there and chiropractors there. Oh, okay. And when I came in there, I tried to get in there back there with them so that I could work on them as well, but they told me no. So Austin actually didn't even have the same luxury as they did because he didn't want to work with them because we've been so working. He, he, w- he didn't get any service throughout the day. It was at the end of the events. We started at 6 a.m. We gave him uh, an hour work, the normal we do, and then got him in the event. And then I didn't work on him till the end of the day, if that. And a lot of times he was exhausted. So it was really only on certain days that we would work on him at the end of the day just because of how beaten down his body was. And so then, just so people know, explain to them some of the weights that these guys were lifting. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna jack these up. These but are but, but, but these are so, ballparks. These are so. several hundred pounds, if not a oh, thousand yeah. pounds. So the farmer carry and the yoke was a, um, I think it was called a giant's medley. It's a thousand pounds. Mm. So you walk with a thousand pound toolbox, 
you know, that however many meters, <laughs> and then you farmer carry with the grip, thousand pounds back, and then on top of that, there was these things called. Uh, there's so many names from but Denny stones, where they're just these rings, and they're four hundred pounds that each. Tears people's hands up. Doesn't oh it? yeah, and they're odd too. They're really odd shaped. You're overhead pressing. You know, five hundred pounds. I heard something that there was records built broken every single event really like just people breaking records because it was the most people have ever lift for the most amount of weights they were throwing 33 pounds <laughs> over their head 20 feet in the air yeah you know it was it was ridiculous so and to see how much they can do and how much they can beat their body down and then on top of that how like everybody was getting something done with it whether it be body tempering deep tissue work, chiropractic adjustment, Graston flossing, all that stuff. They were doing all that behind the scenes. And this guy wasn't doing any of that. Yeah. So we, and maybe he was getting work twice a day on a good day. Most of the time it was just once in the morning. Cause yeah. that's where we really got a lot of our work done is right in the morning where he felt really great right after we were done working on him. What was some of the, uh, and I, I guess not to, I don't know if I don't know if this is an appropriate question to ask, but what were some of the bigger issues you found that he had uh, on a daily basis from from lifting that much weight? What was some of the uh, I guess the the bigger issues you guys had to work on? The biggest thing we were dealing with was a lot of central nervous system fatigue. So at that point, your body's not really using any specific muscle to lift this. It's just using the whole body. Mm. And that taxes your central nervous system to the, the max. So it tightens everything up. So a lot of the times we would just kind of, we do a lot of the static stretching. We use a PNF or contract contract relax therapy. And that's where they push in uh, the muscle. Like you stretch the muscle, get into a static stretch, and then they contract the muscle as hard as they can. While it's being, well, you already have them at that point. Yeah. That's and then they relax. You build them a little bit deeper into a stretch. So they contract again. And what that was doing for us is pretty much just getting us back to baseline and then activating the muscle at the very end of the stretch. So contracting against me and then going through the full range of motion. That was helping us a lot, I think, because we're able to get the body back to relax and actually stretch and realize it's more flexible than it actually is and then have him contract so he's activated feels good he feels really good and that's the biggest thing i think that helps in massage is the fact that if your client likes you and he feels like you do really good work then you could just put your hand on them and say that this is working and they'll be like, that was a great thing that you just did, even though you don't really do anything, yeah. right? But when you actually pair knowledge and techniques that actually work for them, then you get not only the confidence that the athlete has that you're going to do something that's really going to benefit them, but on top of the fact that you're actually doing something that's benefiting them, you get both working together. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is you talk about him not wanting to use somebody else other than you and in in my mind i just visualize the the confidence that he has in you and you know and when you show up to a place like that for events like that like this is uh wrestlemania right it's the super bowl it's the world series these are all the strongest guys from all over the world and they're here to compete there's several events like that but this is probably the most popular and well known you know you it's got to there's got to be some intimidation or some fear to say hey i'm going to try using somebody else to do something else and that's not the place to experiment, I guess. <laughs> well, athletes are extremely superstitious. Sure. And that's like being... And he's Mexican, so that makes it 20 times worse. I don't know why that would make it worse. Oh, that's but... how Mexicans are, man. We're, we're superstitious about everything. <laughs> okay. That makes even more sense than why yeah. you chose me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the biggest thing that I think working with athletes and being one myself, is that I know how superstitious I can be. Where if I don't have, back in the day, if I didn't have the right pre-workout with my right, um, my right shirt, my right lifting belt, my right straps, if I don't have straps before I'm about to deadlift, I can't deadlift. Mm. And it would mess with me so much that it would destroy my lift or I would just not even lift. Yeah. And in football, I've met people that literally will not wash their drawers 
before an event. And if they do, they know it's going to ruin their game. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a time and place, obviously, that's probably a little messed up in the head. And there's probably some therapy we need to do and see a sports psychologist. But in the short term, why not lead into that and just be like, instead of emphasizing and saying, yeah, you definitely need this, just making sure that you have that. Yeah. And if they like the certain electrolytes, making sure they have that on point so that if they need it, instead of being like, don't worry, you don't need it. It's just all in your head. You just be like, here you go. You got it. Yeah. Boom. Well, it, it's it's the confidence, right? I mean, every who doesn't run faster in a brand new pair of shoes? Oh, exactly. You know, so it's kind of one of those things where even though you've done all the work and, and you've pushed yourself, you've pushed your body, you're prepared, physically you're there, like the the computer that runs all that has to be rebooted like you've got to be mentally there you have to be super confident and it changes everything you know the mind's such a a big part of everything that we do that when you go in to compete like that you know everybody's trained every everybody's done the same kind of work maybe not to the same degree exactly but every everybody's there everybody that is there deserves to be there that a lot of times the only thing that differentiates people is their mentality and their mindset and if you can keep that confident sharp, uh, you're going to have a leg up over a few guys. So, And I think that having me there was a big, a big deal for that confidence. Because when we got there, he was stiff. Mm. You know? And this is just normal for anybody when you get off a plane. I'm sure everybody... I was going to say, the flight it can't be comfortable. No. And it's... I always tell all my athletes that the moment that you get on a plane, wear anything compression biggest thing in compression is it's going to stimulate blood flow back and forth and when you're sitting down for what what do you do in the airport while you're waiting for a plane you sit yeah what do you do in the airplane you sit and then the moment you go you're like all right let's go but you're exact you're exhausted after that flight and all that trip the stress so what do you do you relax you know we're not going out and hanging out and have fun so your body's tightened up that whole time i always tell people wear compression socks they even make compression socks all the way up to the knees now, like oh, past really? that. And those, you got big legs, it's very difficult to find them unless you can get them custom made. I'm actually in the process of trying to find someone who will do custom uh, compression all the way up past the knee. But they also make compression shorts for the hips. So anytime you can wear anything compression, it might be uncomfortable, but I guarantee you'll feel so much better. So the compression is like, let's say on the flight. The compression is keeping the blood from staying stagnant lower in the body. Yeah. It's just the heart's pushing it down, the socks are pushing it back up, and that's going to keep you from being, uh, I guess, uh, uh, having too much excess blood in the lower limbs. Well, just pretty much it's stale. It gotcha. feels stale because the body's just sitting there, and it's, it's your body's not moving. The muscles aren't pumping blood where it needs to go. And so the moment you're sitting there, your body's like, all right, well, this blood's going to slow down. It's not going to get to these muscles because we're not using them. If you're sitting down and you start contracting your glutes or you start contracting your quads, your calves, your gastric pneumius needs, your calf muscles need so much blood. They're really good blood pumpers. If you just start doing some calf raises while you're sitting down, you're going to pretty much do what compression socks do. Mm, Gotcha. Now, these are a way for you to do that passively. So you can just keep those things on and they'll just constantly keep pushing blood. And that just keeps your muscles fresh. And after the flight... Your muscles are super tight, especially if you've been sitting that whole long. And if you're a big guy, those muscles are even tighter because right. you're being cramped into a plane seat that's probably two sizes too small. Yeah. So, you know, when I got there, we worked on him. We did our normal thing. We were a lot more gentler than we usually were. But that was a he when he woke up, he's like, dude, I feel stiff, I feel exhausted. And then we worked on them. Did he compete that first day? No. Okay. He, they were there for a few days prior. Oh, and I made sure to get there, I think, two days prior to. Or they were there several days prior. I was there two days prior to the actual start of the event. So that way we could make sure that we had him feeling great the first day. Mm-hmm. So worked on him, did some stuff. And by the, fine, by the day before, he was feeling great. So day before, he was feeling great day of he was feeling amazing so that was the focus on being there two days beforehand now i don't know how much would have changed if he wore compression or if he did i'm not calling him out that he did but if he would have wore compression it might have saved a day of feeling like that 
And I've had people that have flown to Italy for a competition. They wear compressions there. Obviously, they're more petite. They're doing more gymnast type stuff. And they'll use full compression yoga pants. And they say that they don't have to get there a day earlier anymore. That's interesting. Because normally they get there a day earlier, warm up on the ice, feel stiff. And then by the next day, they're good. Now they just don't have to do that anymore. They just still do their warm up, but instead of doing the warm up and feeling stiff, they feel great when they're warming up. Gotcha. Let me ask you this: We talked about it a little bit earlier, but you were talking about the the push pull kind of thing, uh, where you kind of stretch their limbs and they push back on you. Uh, you were talking about it being taxing on you. Yeah. So so, <laughs> what is that like when you got a guy that's that's carrying a thousand pounds and pushing seven hundred? And you've got to, you know, because even even at that, it's I, I go back to when I was younger and we used to do squats, right? The more weight you have on your back, the deeper it, it can push you down, especially when you're a big dude. Now, when you're the weight, how, how do you prepare for something like that? And and what are some of the things you have to do to get a bigger guy to to either move or twist or whatever you're trying to get him to do? What what do you weigh? Because that think that's what it comes I down to. I weigh one eighty. So that's what you're throwing into. On a good day. That's what you're throwing into his lower body is is one eighty. It's more about leverage, mm. I think. Now there, I will say that leverage has its stopping point, but I'll use my I use the table. So a big one that we do that I really like is um, it's pretty much putting him in a squat, the bottom of the squat position, knee to your chest, and when he contracts. He's squeezing his glute and pushing me down. So pretty much trying to get out of the squat. And gotcha. I'm, my shoulder is the floor. I have to use the, the chair, or sorry, the, uh, the end of the table, the crack, and actually pull against it. And his, his foot is right inside my shoulder. There's been a few times where he's so strong that it feels like my bicep tendon is about to snap. Really? Yeah. And so... One of the things that's been big is that I used to be an athlete. I used to train every day, several hours a day. <laughs> when I created my own business, that took a side. Mm -hmm. And I started focusing more on business, more on school, more on education, and less on training. Now working with them, not only am I getting my training in, but I'm realizing how important training is because with working on this guy, working on several people that are similar to that, if I'm not strong enough to just keep them down, I can't get as much out of it. Because the biggest thing with contract relax is the more effort they give, the more benefit they see. Okay. So if you have someone that's 200 pounds and they're pulling as much as they can, they're going to get way better result than if they're 200 pounds and they're just like, I'm going to give you 10%. Because then when they relax, the body's not engaging all muscle fibers during that contraction phase, and they're not going to relax as much. But if you're engaging all the muscle fibers you can, you're trying to push every ounce a little bit you have in there. Then the moment that they relax, you're engaging more muscle fibers, more muscle fibers are relaxing. So you have to have that. You have to be strong, but you also have to realize how much leverage you can do. And I've actually bought mobility straps. I've kind of played around with how I'm positioned because at the end of the day, if I can't hold them down, even with like, and it's gotta be also, I have to be the one holding them down. I can't be, I can't put them on a strap where okay. it's pretty much doing the work for me because I have to feel what he's doing. And I also gotcha. have to gauge how much I'm pushing him back. Cause every single time you contract and relax, you should be getting a little bit more range of motion. So let's say you start right here and then I have you contract and then you relax, you get right there. Right. For you, I'll be like this. You, you stay base point right here and maybe you get a millimeter or a few centimeters deeper into that stretch and we do that three or four times you're almost an inch deeper in your stretch that's stretching more muscles and then we have them fire off as much as you can boom you just got an inch of range of motion and you engage that muscle as strong as you possibly can in that range of motion and i mean those are the types of things that are going to get more performance out of you let's say we're doing the keg throw right and if he's got to get low and throw it higher being able to get an extra inch out of a stretch or get down a little bit farther to, to throw his body back up 
upward, you know, that that's the difference between, you know, getting to the next round and not, I would assume. Well, and then on top of that too, if you can't engage your hips, like let's say that one of the things that we were dealing with in one of my clients is he couldn't activate his hips during an actual um, massage. So we were doing PNF or, or contract relax. And when I was having him contract, I was, everything was fine. Like I was, I was pretty much putting my pinky on it and there was no pressure. Really? So that obviously is a huge issue. If, if this muscle can't actually fire, then when you're actually working out or when you're in a competition mode, let's say you're doing the keg toss, if you can't fire those hips off, that, that keg isn't going to go really anywhere. Or you're using the wrong muscles to get the actual... You're probably using up your, your upper body only to kind of... Yeah, and you can only it. go so far. It, a lot of that is body mechanics. A lot of it is leverage, however you can do it, however you can figure it out and get your muscle, your body in the right position to throw it up. If you can't activate those hips to get into that right body mechanics motion to fire that up and throw it overhead, you're not going to go. Just like if you can't raise your arms over your head, you can just like raise here. That means that you have to bend your back to actually mm. get all the way up and you're in a weaker spot at that point. Right. So that is something that we've noticed a lot is, you know, if a if really big guy, really strong guy that can lift, let's say he lifts thousand pounds, can't even fire that, can't even push me off the ground, even with my pinky, boom, we have an issue. Let's let's figure out how to deal with this issue. How do you go about, is that something that takes time to figure out or is there, is there a way with your experience to, to diagnose what the issue is and then you can start working on it immediately? Let's say something happens out in, at a competition, several day competition, similar to what you guys just experienced in with the world's strongest man. Is there a way for you, maybe it's just through your experience to be able to diagnose, hey, this is the issue, so let's start doing this thing to try and compensate for whatever that, the issue might be? Um, a lot of times, it's not necessarily, well, we have a, there's this thing called body pathways map, and there's a blue spot, or sorry, there's a, it's a blue person pretty much, and it shows you all the connections, all the insertions, all the fascia tissue lineup, and in school, they were telling us, okay, you're going to point to this map and never focus on where you just pointed. Like wherever the client points to and says, this hurts right here. You never focus on that. You always focus on the areas around it and what's leading up to it, what's leading down from it. Mm. And that helps a lot because if someone says tennis elbow, right, their, their elbow hurts, we're never really going to focus on the elbow because... There's not really much going on there. We're going to focus on the wrist flexors, wrist extensors, and sometimes even the hand, maybe even the bicep. But we go up, we go down. We never go right there. I'm not going to sit there and work on your elbow because what I'm going to really do there. Um, and that helps a lot, but it also helps knowing what the person does for a living. It helps knowing what they do on a daily basis for their training, what issues they've had in the past. And so seeing them one time, it's really good when you have someone that will dig into what you can do or what you do. Like if you have a therapy session or a massage session and they're asking you about your business or your job, what kind of training you do, what you've done in the past, it's as much small talk as it is really finding out what, what really is the core issue. Like if you're telling me you have hip issues and we're like, okay, let's, let's work on the hip, let's work on the lower back. But uh, you're also telling me that you don't really walk that much and you sit a lot and you've been sitting for a long time and you've been at this job for 10, 15 years. I'm not thinking this is really an actual injury as much as this is a chronic issue. And maybe your hip flexors are shortened because you sit and they're not flexing as much or mm -hmm. sorry, they're, they're overflexed. And that is a huge issue with anybody that sits. And so a lot of times if someone comes to me with hip issues, the first thing I ask is, okay, do you sit a lot at work? Yeah, okay, sweet. Let's let's hop on the table and we're gonna work on your hip flexors. And they're like, oh man, this is the worst thing I've ever felt. And I'm like, yep, that's <laughs> that's your issue. And they're like, well, yeah, but my lower, lower back hurts. And then as soon as we work on the hip flexor, my lower back doesn't hurt anymore. Well, you know, everything's connected. Every Everything's, uh, you know, you can't push on one spot or pull on another without you know, impacting several other different areas. 
uh, one thing that's weird that happens to me, and, and again, this is one of those stupid questions, but I'm going to ask you anyway, is uh, I sit down a lot at work and home. Sometimes I feel like my hamstrings are getting shorter. Yeah. Right? But what's weird is when I go to get on the floor to stretch and I get on my knees. So in my mind, and maybe it's a dehydration thing too, who knows? But in my mind, I have knelt down, which is kind of sitting, right? The shape is kind of sitting because I've knelt down and I might be leaning on something just to kind of stretch, stretch it out. But so in my mind, my hamstring is shortening, right? Because my knees bent. All of a sudden, I get this crazy cramp in the hamstring. But it's not, it's, it's, in, constri- it's in contraction, right? Mm-hmm. So why is it cramping? Am I dehydrated or is that it just need to be That could be so stretched? many different things. Because um, I notice it's all the time. It's not even like, oh, this happened today. It's every time. Well, so here's a something that helps me with cramping is, and I don't know if I'm just special with this, but anytime I start to get a Charlie horse, back in the day, if I would get a Charlie horse, it'd be just something that's going to last for the next like two minutes, and it's going to suck the whole time. But now when I get a Charlie horse coming on, I just instinctively, when a Charlie horse happens, usually it forces your your toe to go into dorsiflexion to point, mm-hmm. right? Doing the top of the calf raise. What I always do, the moment I feel it, I just go into an extension and right. bring my toes up towards my, my shin and all of a sudden it goes away. And I don't know if that's helping or if the fact that I drink electrolytes every day, all day long, I hate water, tastes dis- terrible. So I use zero water and then I put my own electrolytes in there. And I'm- So what do you mix it with? Water. Oh, with water. Okay. I'm just saying basic water is disgusting. It tastes like crap. Yeah. So I like flavored water and that's why this is red. It's because it has my favorite zeal electrolytes, zeal naturals. I use zeal and relight, which are both made by Redmond's real salt. And I use their salt on everything. Mm. So, and I noticed that once I started doing that and putting on, putting more people on that, anybody that was having cramps, would have way less, or if they were having headaches, they would have way less. Mm. And I'm not saying this is the best one. This is the best one that I've seen. Uh, I just like real Redmond's Real Salt because of where they get their salt from. There's probably several other companies that are good as well. What's, what's special about their salt? Their salt's from a dead lake in um, Utah. Mm. So it's not something that's manufactured. It's very mineral dense. And honestly, it's a lot less saltier than salt. Really? So you get more sodium and the sodium is instead of being manufactured and just basic, it's very mineral dense. It's like sea salt. Celtic mm-hmm. sea salt is a good one, but pink Himalayan salt is a big one that people get. The only problem is most pink Himalayan salt is manufactured. So it's not really from the Himalayas, mm. right? And the whole point of it being from the Himalayas was how it's natural. It's got all these minerals in it. This one it's from a dead lake, dead sea that has not had water for thousands of years and you're pulling it up from where the salt is, right? So you have all the density. And they don't add most. anything else to it or? No, it's just basic. Okay. I'll get a 10 pound tub every like six months. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. So they, and Zeal is a, they put a whole bunch of stuff in theirs, but the cool thing about them is also, we try and get, come away from like red dyes, any type of artificial flavors. I will say they have artificial flavors in there, but that's why it tastes so good. Yeah. But when you look at like something like this that's red, it's not red food coloring, it's beetroot pl- powder. That's the coloring. Or they have one that's blue raspberry that uses blue algae mm. as the actual color, which there's a lot of benefits to blue algae, like the actual supplement. So not only are you getting, and beetroot too, beetroot is a nitric oxide producer. So not only are you getting the benefits from the electrolytes, you're not getting the benefits or the the cons from the dyes, you're also getting the benefits from what they color their their supplements with. Yeah. Let me ask you this. For a fat, handsome, out of shape guy who's starting to exercise again, I I go through these little ups and downs, these peaks and valleys where I I get really into it and then I start focusing on something else and then you kind of put it at the wayside. But 
What is something your average Joe Blow, non-competitive, high-performance athlete needs to be mindful of when they start reintroducing exercise? What what advice would you give them other than the warm up and the stretching? Are, are there certain things that you think will benefit somebody who is something simple they can do in a sense that it can allow them to continue going longer? I mean, hiring a hiring a trainer is going to help, right? Uh, and I've had this conversation many times with people and with Tim, and I, I think Tim's really intelligent. Uh, but a lot of times before dealing with Tim and some of the other guys, I would always jump into something, and before I knew it, I was injured. I didn't take care of certain things or maybe stretch the way I should have, and so I'm, I'm hurt, right? I'm two weeks in, some, pulled something, something's hurt, and so I might take a month to get over that, or I might take two more weeks or something, and then I find myself starting over every time. So for average Joe Blow office worker who decides he wants to start getting fit again, what are some of the things you think that maybe little tweaks and things that people can do in addition to their exercising to make that make that ability to continue to perform last longer than getting hurt every time they go to the gym and have to start over? I would say start simple, very short and simple, right? The biggest thing that we always do, especially when we have this goal, is we start way too high with it. And then when we're not when we realize that we're not at that point anymore, it crashes our dreams, screws up our <laughs> whole momentum, and then also crushes our confidence. Sure. So you're in my head right now. <laughs> we have we have a guy like for me. If I was like, okay, I used to work out seven days a week, two to three hours a day, hmm. eat twelve thousand calories. You know, if I expected, there's been times where I'm like, all right, I'm going to work out seven days a week now, just for an hour first time I miss one day, I'm like, might as well not even do it because I missed the whole day. I'll start next week. Yeah. And that's the problem that most people run into is they start. So they, they compare themselves to what they used to be. You have right. to think about where you are right now. If you're not training five days a week, if you're not training one day a week, why not just chart training or start with consistency. So every day, find something that you can do every day, but make it super simple that you can do in routine. So do it for one minute a day. So just do something body weight, like body weight squats. If you can't do body weight squats, body weight sits where you're sitting on a chair and standing back up, sit back down, stand back up, do push-ups. If you can't do push-ups, you got your knees to do some push-ups. If you can do that, do 10 of them. But you're trying to do something that you can get in a routine right when you wake up, just boom, hit out 10 push-ups. Hit up 10 bodyweight squats where you're sitting on the bed, sitting up, sitting on, sitting up. Move the hips around. You know, while you're on the bed, do something that just feels good. Like there's a pose that I really love. It's called scorpion. And there's so many different poses of that, but it's kind of what you were saying about having your leg dropped over and then you're reaching for the other side. It's pretty much spinal twisting. And it's a way for one for you to uh, stretch all these muscles from the core up, you know, so you're getting your hips all the way up to your, uh, to your scapula and everything in between. And when you do that, when you first wake up, when we're locked up, when we first wake up, so this helps stretch everything out, lengthen everything out. And again, if it's something small where you can do it in less than a minute a day, there's no excuse for you not to do it. Right. And even if you say, okay, well, I didn't do it today. You already thought about it. You're going to bed. Knock it out. Yeah. You know, right before you go to bed, just hit those 10 push ups or 10 by weight squat. Or if you can't do that, hit one. You know, hit one push up, hit one by weight squat or just one or the other. But the biggest thing is starting in a way that you can just do one of something for a very short period of time that makes it so easy. It's almost like meditating. If anybody can meditate, I, I'm, I'm terrible at it. But the thing that helps me with it is I can meditate for 30 seconds. And I haven't gone past that, but I can still do it for 30 seconds every day. And it has helped me tremendously when I do decide to go into phases where I'll meditate longer. But knowing that I'm consistent with it is almost a confidence boost because you're like, I've done this 
for two weeks every single day. And if someone starts poking holes in your story, you're like, hey, dude, at least I'm doing it. Yeah. You know, and that's a huge goal because, again, it gives you a starting point. You do this for a month. And then all of a sudden you're like, where, where have I been doing? Okay, I've been doing one push up a day, one body squat weight a day, and doing the stretch. All right, I want to do two push ups a day, two body weight squats a day, and the stretch for two minutes a day. And that might not seem like a lot, and especially when you start looking at it from an outside perspective that does way more than that, you're going to look at that and be like, okay, well, you should be doing more. Focusing on your goal. 12 months time, one year, you're doing 12 of each and you're doing more stretches instead of just that one for two minutes, you're doing different stretches and you're feeling a lot better. And we're talking about compounding interest, right? You've been doing this for the last 12 months. You're going to be a lot more athletic, a lot more, a lot more better place feeling wise, physically and emotionally than you were in a year from now, like backwards. And then on top of that, if you would have started with the fact that I'm just going to go to the gym and kill myself every day and you actually didn't do it for the full year, because how many of us know that you're going to, you have all those new year's resolutions, you do it and then you feel like crap. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, you know what? I'm going to do it tomorrow. And then six months go by, you did it maybe twice in yeah. the six months, maybe another six months go by. You did it four times in those six months. Your six times versus my daily, I'm we might you might get a little bit more benefit because you actually got more resistance out of it, but I got more benefit because I was consistent. Well, you know one one thing that kind of sticks out and kind of goes along with what you're saying is is that and I've heard it before. My buddy Laredo has told me you know motion the motions lotion thing, and, and it's interesting because one thing that really stuck out today is the pain clock. You know, a lot of times I, you sit there and, and hear somebody go, uh, and I'm, I'm from a small town, so everybody's a smart ass, right? So uh, uh, it's kind of one of those things where, hey, it hurts when I do this, and well, don't do that, you know? And uh, it's one thing to, to joke and say that, but it's interesting because doing those small things daily uh, keeps the body moving, and it starts to push that pain clock in the other direction. Because uh, it's it, it you know when you talk about it, and I've been thinking about it. It's interesting because you find yourself doing fewer and fewer things. You know, I, I, my father-in-law just turned ninety-one, and you know, even when my dad was, was was still with us, you know, there were there were certain things that that they had to do. And I remember having a conversation with my sister one time. She's like, I don't know why he he feels like he needs to do this, you know, whatever it was, physical. And uh, I I remember telling her it's because if he stops doing it he's never going to do it again, you know? And that's a lot for somebody to kind of take in for themselves. Hey, if I, if I stop doing this thing now because it hurts too much, I may never get back to this point again, especially when, as you get older in life, right? And uh, uh, so it's important. It's important to do those things. You know, I, I've talked with several people before, you know, people who are in the fitness industry. And, and it's funny because, like, uh, maybe it's me getting older as well. You know, it's kind of like, well, uh, there's time, you know, there's time. Well, I'll get back into it later. The manana like, syndrome, right? Yes. And, it, and it's funny because, uh, uh, when you, when you compound that with the pain clock, you go, Hey man, you got a lot less time than what you think you got. You know, you really need to get moving and you really need to get those, those well, joints it's, moving. It's that big idea of use it or lose it. And right. I think that that, that saying has gotten a lot of traction, but not a lot of people use it for the right reasons i don't know it just seems like with mobility stretching and working out you could use so much out of that mm -hmm. like that little that little slogan if you're not doing one push-up or like a box jump you know if you're not jumping off i see a curb and i just jump on it mm -hmm. i jump off of it we have stairs at heavy metal fitness and i don't know if anybody's seen me but every single time i look at those stairs i jump off of them yeah and they're five steps and it's more mentally for me because when I got injured on my knee, it was because of a box jump. Mm. And for a year, I couldn't box jump. And so now, every time I have the ability to do a jump, even if it's on a curb, I'm like, I'm taking this. Yeah. Because otherwise, I'm going to lose it. Right. And a lot of times, that there, there's, if you look at how people get walkers, that is the biggest way to use it or lose it is, is very... 
vividly seen and how much of an impact that can be. Someone is, doctor tells you like, okay, you're limping along, you're not feeling too good. Okay, we need to put you on a walker. Well, all of a sudden, you're limping along without the walker becomes debilitated where you can't even walk without the walker. Right. You can't even you can't even do what you originally done. The walker didn't help you. It made your body rely on that walker for any movement. Well, you know the other the other thing is is I rarely see somebody with a walker whose spine hasn't curved. You know, because they're they're basically leaning into the walker which which makes their back hunch, I guess. And uh, the longer you use that, you start to see that that posture uh, declining and uh, just starts contributing. It's going to be interesting to see how many people with like from with the mobile phone area mm -hmm. when you actually get people with walkers because the people are getting that <laughs> that hump already from the texting. Yeah. Now they're going to be on walkers and they're going to get a big one. That's going to be a whole hunchback. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a. Uh... It's scary when you think about it. <laughs> I love it. I think it's it's fun to see because it's it's almost a reminder, an automatic reminder. Like if you're not doing what they're like, if you see someone on a walker or you see someone with a hunched neck, or if you see someone uh, texting and you see they're they're down like that, and you watch them and you're like, oh that's weird, and you text like that, that is. I automatically think about it and I'm like, oh, it's I'm a reminder, be... lift it up, right? Yeah. And I, I think, or I have my desk and I'll squat down and that way I'm looking at my phone this way. And the more I see people doing it wrong, the more it reminds me to do it right. Yeah. And the more people I see not training, the more it focuses me to train. Right. Or when I see people on eating unhealthy, I'm like, oh, that's not shame on them, but oh, they're doing something that they shouldn't do. And if I'm about to eat unhealthy, I'm like, oh, bad, better Ryan. I shouldn't do that. Up. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting, the way to, uh, the good thought process. Well, let me ask you something, Ryan. Where can people find you? Uh, they can find me on Instagram at Mobilized Beast, or they can go to Heavy Metal in San Antonio, Texas, and I will always be there usually we were talking about uh earlier they can uh through your instagram they can they can uh oh they can book, book now right yeah that was something i didn't even know existed <laughs> so i'm not very tech savvy but someone showed me that hey this thing that i do where i schedule people with my little physical planner apparently there's a google planner that you can do and they just click on the time that they want because you set the availability and so that is now available I'm probably so ancient because most people would think that's super easy to do. But <laughs> yeah, if you go to my Instagram at Mobilized Beast, you can actually find a way to book your session with me. How long are most sessions? Most sessions are an hour. Most okay. of the time, most most massage sessions can be like 90 minutes to two hours long. The type of work that we do, since it's more sports massage, most people can't usually get more than an hour out of it because their body starts either rejecting it or again, sometimes the sessions can be a little aggressive and sometimes painful and the body doesn't like being in pain for more than an hour. Okay. So, but the biggest things that we do, um, is we do do a lot of cupping. We do Graston work. What is Graston work? Scraping. Oh, is, that that, is that that long bar? Yeah. And what is that doing when you do when you use that? So a lot of the stuff that Graston works on is fascial tissue. So you have your dermis layer, and then right below that you have some subcutaneous tissue, and then right above the muscle tissue you have fascia tissue. Mm. And a lot of times that gets stuck and it binds up and it looks like spider webs, and sometimes those spider webs can get even closer together and more bound up more spider web like and so what this does what Graston does is it scrapes that tissue and what's interesting is that if you scrape someone and it hurts and you're giving very light pressure that is a key sign that uh, that is what's needed if you so are what, what is the body feeling when that's a problem <laughs> it feels like tearing okay like, like it feels like before like, you get it done like oh before yeah like you how, can feel how do you just know like that a, that's something you need that's more intuition to okay. the massage therapist. No one comes up to you and says, I like, I want grass. I'm feeling enough. this and I need that. That's yeah. It. Normally what, what's going on mm -hmm. is, um, either you have a lot of inflammation, you have a lot of, uh, swelling in that area. You have a chronic issue. 
let's say if you have bicep tendonitis, you have shoulder problems, that is definitely going to have a lot of problems in this area, the shoulder area, the bicep area, the elbow area, and all the way up into this, the pec area, the trap back of the shoulder. So because it's such a cl uh, clustered area, there's a lot of bound up tissue. And so that is a key sign that I would use either Graston or cupping. A lot of times I'll ask the person, do you like either one? Because if they like it, again, we're going back into the subconscious and going with what they think they like. If someone tells me they so don't like- So those two do similar things, the cupping and- Similar, the, okay. yeah, the, the difference is, is that with the cupping, it's gonna bring up fluid that's been trapped up and that's where you get those dark circles. Mm grass and you're just loosing up tissue so that it brings up inflammation and and fluid up to the surface again where does it go from there a lymphatic system deals with it so our lymphatic system is kind of like our body's sewer system mm. and what happens is it's a circulatory system so it never ends it doesn't have any stopping points but as it's going the lymphatic system takes up the inflammation and then circulates it circulates it and it starts breaking it down so that way it can be excreted the way it needs to be excreted. And then it's always going, it's never stopping. That's why if someone has problems with their lymphatic system, it's a very big deal with inflammation. They have to get a lot of supplementation, a lot of um, hospital visits because it's your body's way of dealing with what we deal with on an everyday basis. You build up inflammation just by walking, just by getting up. You stress out, you're building up inflammation. And if you have a problem with your lymphatic system, you have a problem with your whole system. Body's so complicated. It is man. <laughs> so complicated, but it's so amazing. Yeah. It's it's so interesting. I love every <clears throat> moment of working on the body because it's it's just always surprising you and you can you're always building up your tool, your tool belt. You know, what works for some person for the same issue won't work for the other person. And we're in the, in the point where we're looking at different music. If you ever go to a massage place, you're going to be listening to spa music or roll, rolling thunder or ocean waves. I like to play whatever client likes. So if they like punk rock, we'll listen to punk rock. If they like Led Zeppelin, we'll play Led Zeppelin. Country, we'll play country. And we're even playing with comedy like stand-up comedy yeah. or my favorite is south park right now <laughs> i have a few clients that were playing south park during their sessions and yeah. they're laughing while we're working on them and so you get them to make a smile you get them to have fun and their body realizes that the deep work that we're doing isn't painful it's fun for yeah. them you know yeah and again that goes back to the mind being controlling the body like that and and being able to put it in a, in a good state so uh, that's pretty smart. Yeah. <laughs> hey, phone number wise, can they find all that on on uh, your your? Yeah, Instagram if they need well? to, if they need to reach out to me, I'm pretty good at uh, replying on Instagram. Um, someone manages that for me. Well, yeah, they manage the the um... text and, and messaging. No, 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 that's all me. Okay. Like any any time that you get a reply from Instagram or a like or anything like that, that's always going to be me. It's more of the actual like finding out the editing acts aspect that person gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. does that but i'm i make all my before i had the the booking app i would schedule all my appointments through instagram or at the gym physically if you're ever in san antonio and check out heavy metal fitness it is one of the best gyms in texas it is they have the strongest guys the strongest women and even if you're not into doing that type of stuff it's still an amazing community to work out there. And you just go in there, you just want to lift. Yeah. You just want to be stronger. And that's why I like working there with those athletes because I know that when when my client leaves and I give them homework, they're more likely to do it because if you, if you give a client homework and they're just like, okay, I just want to feel better. I don't want to do all this stuff that you want me to do to feel better. If I feel pain, I'm just going to go see you again. You know, that, that's great for a return client, but for someone who wants you to get better and wants you to, to see you get better and not see you again for the same issue, you know, I like when people do my homework. Yeah. And a lot of people in heavy metal that come to heavy metal, they, they like doing their homework. They like learning. They like 
uh, figuring out ways to, to better themselves. And, and so I enjoy working with that type of population. Yeah. It's good that they got you there now too. So. Yeah. And yeah. you go, you also get to learn, um, how to kind of coerce people into liking the homework. Yeah. You know? So, well, you, you know, what's funny is, is like I told you, I like doing the park thing. And, uh, uh, I've had this conversation several times on this podcast about my mental blocks with, uh, just, I'm, I'm an idiot, but it's, it's funny because it's, it's when you have that atmosphere, it's, it's, it's contagious and it's infectious and, oh, yeah. and, and I'm an idiot for not utilizing that more often. So, well, and, and you're, I think the biggest thing is too, is, is mindset shifting <clears throat> and we'll take that, that example you know, the, the brain doesn't know the difference between sarcasm and truth, right? So if you sit there and say, well, the best sarcasm has truth. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. But if you go and say that you're, you're stupid, you're, you don't know what you're doing, even if you're joking about it, your brain realizes that's true. And that's why one of the things I really enjoy about working with people is when they're having a stressful day, trying to get them to see it a little bit differently for road rage incidents, right? Someone mm -hmm. cuts you off instead of being like that son of a bitch flipping them off. You'd just be like, Hey, that guy gave me a chance to breathe, you know? And even if you don't believe it at that time, the more you say it, the more you start realizing that it's true. That someone cuts you off and you know, normally I would react right away and just flip you off and, call you some bitch and everything else and tell you but now i'm thinking about it and i'm breathing and i still want to do it but there's a difference you know between reactive and responsive and i think that that's one of the things i've used in my therapy and we get them to breathe more it gives you a chance to pause and and we don't pause a lot in life yeah and whenever you get the chance especially when something doesn't go your way we're very quick to reactive and you know, when you're at the park or when you're at your, your roadblock, instead of going like, oh, man, this sucks. Look at where you are. Pause. If you're an extra foot than you were last week, be gracious of that extra foot versus where you stopped. Yeah. You know? You know, what's funny is, is uh, I've had a conversation with my wife and other friends here recently. And it's funny because, uh, it's, it's a drastic mental change, uh, where my friends and my wife don't really believe me. <laughs> but uh, I grew up in a, in a, like I told you, around a lot of smart asses and motherfuckers. And, uh, and I'm one, right? Uh, I've, been a, I've been guilty of being a motherfucker a lot in my life. But I, I told my wife, I said, you know what? I'm 47. Uh, I break things up in 20 years, right? The first 20 years, you're trying to get out of your parents' house. And your next 20 years, you're trying to accumulate things and, and uh, start a family. And then your next 20 years, which is where I'm at, I told her, I said, I'm working on my stress. I said, I'm, I'm not trying to fight every fight. And not everything has to be a fire. Uh, I'm just, I don't want to do it anymore. You know, I will if I have to because I'm really good at it. But I'm trying to work on being different. And it's funny because like it was literally one day I, I made this mental switch and and uh, so sometimes me and my wife will have a conversation and she'll be a little elevated and and I'll tell her I'm like I'm not trying to I'm not trying to do this you know but I find it's 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 kind of one of those things where even in traffic for example uh, I love being honry I love honry people and I love honry things but it's exhausting man you know and when you can realize hey you don't need to do this all the time. You know, sure, a lot of people do it because they don't want to be taken advantage of and they don't want to be pushovers and things of that nature. But it's like surround yourself by, around better people, you know, to where you don't get taken advantage of like that. But, uh, yeah, the next 20 years, man, working on that stress level. <laughs> well, if you ever need help with that, let me know. Cause I, uh, we also work at a place called Evolve. Yeah. You ever heard of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, need, to, I need to go. I've got uh, I got uh, some Jeremy gift cards. Yeah, yeah. He's, he came through. We had, a, we had a little concert here with some mariachi girls, and him and his wife came by. But Evolve's amazing, man. It, and I really need to make a point to get out there more often because yeah. I, when the last time we had gone, me and my wife went. We did the, hot, we did the tub, the, the cold plunge. It was so funny because I think we got there late. So we were probably there 15, 20 minutes. So I think we did five... 
in the plunge, the cold plunge, and then I did the rest of the time in the the uh, asana. And we left 15, 20 minutes. And it was so funny because we sat in the truck and we looked at each other and I said, I feel like I did something. You know, uh, it wasn't a workout, but my body was telling me, hey, you did something. You it know? was thanking you. Yes. You know, and, and it that's, felt good. That's one of the things I really love about that place is that there has been times where, where I wasn't as busy as I am now, where I would go home, want to go home and just relax after a really stressful day. And because we built the communal sauna, which at the time was one of the scariest ideas because most people didn't like the idea mm. of sitting around and sweating with someone. But when I would get those days where I'm just like, I just want to be alone, just want to hang out with my dogs, go to sleep, I hate my day. I would be like, all right, you know what? I'm just going to go to the sauna because we close at eight. You know, I'll be in there for an hour. I can still get some good sleep and I'll just be in there sweating. Sauna helps you sleep. Does it raise your body temperature? Boom, 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 all that science stuff. And I would go in there and I would just have these conversations with people and I would just leave always going, I'm glad I went to the sauna. I'm glad I went there because it shifted my mindset because I'm either able to see someone that's in a negative mindset, help them out of it, or just talking with friends just uplifts my spirit. Yeah. You know, and, uh, or I'd get some, uh, stock tips from my friend so I can try and make sense of the stock market. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny because there's times where, uh, I feel I, 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 uh, there's a Kendrick Lamar song where he calls himself, uh, antisocial extrovert. And uh, oftentimes feel like that, that's what I am. I mean, I, I'm extroverted, but I can't stand being, I like being alone. I, I'm, I'm not going to say I can't stand being around people. I like being alone. I like and, being with my circle of friends. Well, you and, know, I like strangers. Like, I love my circle of friends. Uh, a lot of them are really busy. But I do enjoy interacting with random people that I've never met before. And, and it's funny because, like, even in this podcast, doing this podcast, I get to meet different types of personalities, Right. And, and I like to, uh, I like to have conversations with those people. So again, it kind of goes back to, this is going to sound so stupid and we've kind of gone off on a tangent. We're not even talking about what he does for a living anymore. Uh, it's funny because I like really nice people, right? I like being around really nice people, but I love ornery things. I love the the contrast of the two and I, I always tell people i don't do gray areas very well i gotta do i'm either on or i'm off you know i either want to be with somebody around somebody really sweet or i want to be around a motherfucker you know and because i my personality is a combination of those things so being exposed to those types of people i like it right but i also just like being by myself but i have to be careful because if i allow myself to just be by myself too long i'll stay over there you know what I'm saying? It's almost like you kind of have to sometimes force yourself into the public and to go oh, yeah. hang out with people. And that's kind of where I struggle, right? Because it's like everything else, right? It's easier not to go exercise. It's easier not to go get a massage. You just don't do those range of motions. You know, it's easy to stay home and not have to interact with people. But these are things that, that contribute to your life and make your life better, you know? So you kind of have to put yourself in those discomfort places. That way you can grow as a person. Otherwise... You're going to stay the motherfucker from Live Oak County all your life. <laughs> oh, yeah. You got to, you absolutely have to get uncomfortable. And I think what ends up happening after you get uncomfortable is look at the cold plunge. You hate, I will say that. Oh, I hated it while I was there. <laughs> like self reflection, like 100%, is I went to the cold plunge one day and I was talking with my friend and I was in a very depressive state. I've been that way for like six hours. And I asked my friend, who was kind of a coach at the time, and he says, uh, he's like, what's wrong with you? What the, pull your head out of your ass. And I was like, <laughs> dude, I'm just not going to lie. I'm in a depressive mood right now. Yeah. And he's like, why don't you do a cold punch? And I'm like, no, it's not going to work. And he's like, so you would rather spend the next six hours again in a depressive state rather than five minutes in the cold plunge? And I was like, yes. And just hearing myself say that, all the knowledge that I have, the science I know, I've researched so much on cold plunging. And I know how much it helps being in a depressive mood. My brain automatically went, no, I would rather be in a depressed state for another 
six hours than feel <laughs> physically cold for five minutes. And I looked at that and I was like, you're right. Okay, I'm gonna try this out. Worst case scenario, it sucks for five minutes and it sucks for another six hours. I go on a cold plunge, two minutes later, I'm like, dude, didn't need five. Feeling great. Yeah. And it's it's amazing how much our brain looks feels like it tries to self preserve preserve your mental state when it almost seems like it's trying to work against you like yeah. reactively <clears throat> you're in a depressed state it says hey we we hate our life right now we don't want to do this anymore someone's giving us an out and we're like no because we want to be right we want to be right that we're depressed and we want to stay depressed and we know that if we don't do anything we're going to stay that way yeah and that makes us right well you know what's screwed up too about about that mentality is there's there's comfort in that right it's like okay i'm upset i'm depressed uh, i'm blue i'm irritated i'm angry and, and it's like i'm here right now i just i'll stay here you know it's kind of one of those things where it's, you know you, you just it's it's you get to this level of comfort, right? Well, I always get here from time to time. I have these weird, strange little ups and downs where uh, I was, and I've had conversations with people before where it's like I, I do great, and then I have my little blue time, right? And it happens ever so often. I don't know when it is. It there's nothing that triggers it. I just I there's these peaks, and now there's these valleys, you know. And and so it, through the course of your life, you hit these peaks and valleys, and you're like, okay, I already know what that's like. You know, so well, when you, you have hit, to, sorry, you have to have those ups in order to have the downs right. or sorry, you have to have the downs in order to have the ups. And if you didn't have the downs, you wouldn't know what an up feels like. Right. You know, the biggest thing is taking 90 seconds to feel that emotion. Cause a lot of times when we feel that down. We try and figure out why it's going on. We try and get on our phone. Why am I feeling this way? Let's go on Instagram, let's go on social media, Netflix, playing a video game. You're trying so hard to get rid of it. Instead of getting rid of it, what do you think that cold plunge for two minutes was doing? Mm -hmm. All it was doing is setting your mind to focus on something else for two minutes. Right. So if you sit there and just for 90 seconds or even two minutes, just be like, just breathe and focus on something completely different than your emotions maybe just focus on your breath try and count your breath like do some box breathing or some battle breathing and doing that for however long you want to do two minutes and then reassess where your brain is at after two minutes you might be in the same spot and either a you can say hey at least i thought about something else for two minutes or you're not going to be in the same spot yeah you know well, I think the camera told us we're done. Right? Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> I don't know which one. I knew that to... camera sound from when I did podcast. I think so. it was the middle one, but yeah. I think the other two are recording. Hey, that's all right, all right? But man, I tell you what, I appreciate you. Well, I've had a good again. time. Yeah, we, we need to do another one. Yeah. You've got some podcasts out there in the universe, don't you? I do. I have like four. Well, well what's the name? It's called Cognifit. Okay. Cogna dash fit. Okay. And and uh, tell everybody what, what uh, your four episodes are about so four episodes about our um brain training uh mycelium psilocybin the it's got very silent in here for a second there the uh, mainly what we focus on on the podcast when i was doing it is how to personal development we talk about the breathing exercises battle breathing box breathing i have like 20 hours of podcasts recorded that if someone would like to edit them for free Throw it at me, man. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, if you would like to, yeah. That would be even best. It's just um, I love what I do right now, and I have them, and I would love to keep doing them. And the more the more people I found find that would like to record with me, you know, the better. It's just so much fun doing what I do and getting to talk to people on, you know, one-on-one because on one, I think people are a lot different too when they know they're not being recorded. You know, you're yeah. you're much more mindful about what you're saying because you can impact a lot more people. Sure. But when you're you're single and you're you're talking to one person and it's privatized and there's no recording, it's very different. Of and you can also get I feel like a lot more impact on that one person. Yeah. That's awesome. But man. yeah, if anybody wants to listen to them, it's on Spotify. It's on Amazon. I think it's on everywhere. We can YouTube we, as well. 
No. Okay. That was an extra step that I just did not have the gumption Trust to do. Trust me, I know. And, and then I'm, I'm OCD, right? So it was kind of like when I decided to transition from just audio to, to audio and video. Uh, and then I, it was kind of, I don't know what episode it was, but the first one I put on. And then in my mind, I was like, I got to put everything on YouTube. And so I had to go back to all the other ones that I didn't have video for. And I just put up a, set up a photo, ran it through, but I ha- I, I'm OCD, man. If I got to do one, no, I, I get do what that. I, all, so. I think the, the thing that's killed me is the, is the upload time. And oh, it's time consuming. It's extremely. And then on top of that, too, if it's, I'm, I think I'm perfectionist. And the fact that if I'm like, I heard that, uh, in the podcast, the whole thing's trash. <laughs> and it's definitely not the smartest way to do things. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a, a learning curve, especially with all this things we got going on in life. But it's definitely something I want to get back into. Yeah. And I love I love you inviting me out here. Absolutely, and I would definitely man. love to do more. So You know, what's funny is you talked about the, uh, I do that a lot. And, and for a long time, I would talk myself out of doing things because I didn't think I could do it perfectly. And so, I, I mean, even if it was coming up with a project at the house, you know, I'd sit there and go, well, I know how to do this, I know how to do that, I can afford to buy that. And, and all of a sudden it was like, ah, I can't, I won't be able to do that, and it's not going to be perfect. And so I was listening to uh, uh, Rogan and uh, David Lee Roth, and David Lee Roth was talking about, and I forget the word, I'm sure somebody hears this, they're going to know what the word is, but there's a Japanese word for perfection in imperfection. And the first time I ever heard that, I was like, that didn't make any sense, right? It was like, how can, how can imperfection be perfect? And uh, slowly as I've done these and I've gotten a little older, and age, age matures you, right? And age ch- turns you into a different person. You know, I've learned to let some of that go. You know, I've learned to, to uh, a friend of mine I had on here once, she said, uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If you can do something well and it's not perfect, it was worth doing as opposed to trying to do it perfect and, and stopping because you can't achieve that perfection. And uh, every now and then, God slaps me in the face. And those are a few times where I get slapped in the face and I go, oh, you're being stupid. Keep going. So let me know, man. We'll do another one. Sounds good. Ryan, I appreciate you, brother. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Peace everybody, out. for listening. Thanks for listening to the Gabe Molina Podcast.